Okay, well, it's 11 o'clock by my watch, so we'll make a start. We've still got a few people joining us, but that's okay. We'll introduce our, our panellists this morning in a second, but I'll just start with some housekeeping. You should have access to a Q&A box or a chat box uh, there on your screen. If you'd like to ask any questions as we go along, please feel free to type into the, into the Q&A box. Uh, alternatively, you can take yourself off mute and uh, ask a question if, if you've got the courage to speak up. Uh, that's not a problem. And then we will also leave some time at the end for questions and answers. Uh, so we're here today to talk about retirement. And uh, it's definitely one of my favourite topics to talk about. Here at Up12, we look after uh, about 3,000 families who are going through this journey or, or been through this journey. And watching them enjoy their lives and travelling, grandparenting and volunteering and all the wonderful things that go with retirement. You know, it's, it's so enjoyable to have those conversations with them and I just love talking about it. Um, so looking forward to spending the next hour with you today. Now, just start with a general disclaimer here. Everything we discuss today is general information, okay, and uh, you should seek professional advice based on your personal circumstances. So uh, my name's Andrew Dunbar. I'm a director of Apt Wealth uh, Partners, and I work with a, a lot of retirees, uh, helping them deal with their finances. I was lucky enough in 2019 to be awarded the Certified Financial Planner of the Year in Australia, uh, but that's more a reflection of our wonderful team than me individually. Uh, but I will be leading the discussion today. And joining me today is Wayne Bishop from Changing Gears. And Wayne's an expert in helping people transition through life stages and particularly in building a purposeful vision for life after work. So welcome, Wayne. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So we've got an agenda here of a few things that we want to run through, run through today. Um, and, and I'm sorry to do this to you, Wayne, but I'd love to just put you on the spot here for, for a second. And I know that you love your research. Uh, and I thought it might be worth just setting the scene for everyone by sharing everyone with everyone the four pillars of the new retirement uh, that came out of a significant study that I know you've followed. I'm putting you on the spot, so hopefully uh, hopefully those four pillars uh, are known to you. But could you share Absolutely. those with everyone? Uh, I can't see them at the moment. I've got the okay. agenda on at the moment. Yeah, that's okay. Well, I know I got them from I got them from you, uh, and they are yes. health, purpose, finances, and family. And I know Wayne is very big on those, and uh, followed that study to to come up with those four pillars for the new retirement. And so you can see here on our agenda a lot a lot of the things we're going to talk to are around your finances for sure. And I think that's something that everyone is concerned about. But also these, these pillars of the new retirement around health, purpose and family are becoming increasingly important and they're often overlooked. So we're going to spend some time uh, and draw on Wayne's expertise to talk about that transition through retirement. So I'll start today with, with this, and this is our favourite quote at App 12 Partners, and it really guides everything we, we do with our clients. And it's at your end, you'll regret the things you didn't do instead of the things that you did. And I think, you know, often we go through life and we're continually worrying about the future and saving for the future and thinking, you know, one day I'd love to do that. But actually, we have to take a step back and enjoy life today. You know, life is short or very short, and that's the only two options that, that we, we get. So we've got to make the most of things. And so really for us, it's about a balance. We've got to enjoy today, do the things that make us happy today, and also, of course, have an eye on tomorrow and plan for the future. Now, uh, this, this is a stat that I find is incredible. Australians love to dream about retirement, but one in five Australians think about retirement daily or often. I just find that that is absolutely staggering. Uh, and there's so many questions that go around in people's mind. Wayne, I'd be interested in um, some of the questions perhaps that you often get asked about retirement. Well, it's, it's very interesting because the, the, the work that we do, we work with organisations um, and with their mature age cohort, and that generally involves employees over about the age of 45, 50 plus. Uh, and one of the things that we find is that the 
uh, people are remarkably unprepared for uh, life after work. And that, uh, and while they might think about it, um, and as far as action is concerned, that's not been our experience. And we've had probably 8,000 8, odd employees and participants come through our programs. And one of the things that we find striking is that they don't know what they don't know. Uh, and they don't know, in some cases, how to go about the planning process. And they don't know how to access trusted advice. And so this is a really important part of the whole process because we know, as you were saying, the significance of being able to, and we're great advocates for people uh, uh, working with a trusted advisor. Uh, but in a lot of cases that uh, we're finding people are just floating and really need some, um, some guidance uh, with that, that, that next life stage. Some of the questions that we, uh, we regularly get um, relate to uh, a high percentage of the questions still relate to um, to finances. Uh, some of these are on the screen now. How much is how much is enough? How much do I need? Uh, we find a lot of people uh, inquire about the Centrelink entitlements, uh, and then increasingly we're having people talking about, and this has probably been had a blowtorch with the with COVID nineteen, talking about uh, their work and transitions from work, and how they might be able to create a pathway. To life after work and what that might look like um, and increasingly now our conversations are around helping them understand um, how they can have a meaningful life after work because people tend to underestimate the relationships and the the structure that comes with work and how you're going to replace that and I think one of the key messages there is how how we can start to start that process before they leave the work environment yeah. um, so that's a, that's essentially uh, and, and, and the questions that generally we get in our sessions, and I'll take you through those in a bit more detail later, um, but the, when we get them comfortable and start talking about themselves, um, there's a high percentage of the questions are still financial. And uh, this is why it's so important that they, they do their planning uh, with, a, with a trusted professional. And, uh, and it's so important that, that some of these issues that we'll talk about later on are identified early so that they can, uh, you can point them in the right direction and also introduce them to resources they can access in life beyond work. Excellent. Thanks, Wayne. Yeah, I know we'll touch on a lot of that uh, uh, later, but that's very interesting. So many questions, so many questions. Uh, without doubt, the biggest one that we get asked is how much do I need to retire? So what I'd like to do actually now is just run a quick poll uh, around the room. And there's no right or wrong answer here, but I'd love to get the feedback from those on the, on the call about how much do you think you need to retire? So I'll put this poll up on the screen. Hopefully everyone can, can see this. Please put in what, what you think. Again, there's no right or wrong answer. Just give everyone another couple of seconds just to put in what they think. Excellent. And okay, I'll end the poll now. Fantastic. So you know you can you can see here uh, a variety of results from the audience, which is typically what we find. Uh, it is a very individual individual thing. So look, how much do you need to retire? Is it 300,000? Uh, is it 500,000? Is it 750,000? Is it a million, you know, or is it more? It is a very individual answer this. Um, now, if you look at the official studies, okay, uh, the Australian Bureau of Statistics and the Association of Superannuation Fund funds, they started this uh, paper that they do and they've updated every quarter on what it costs people to live comfortably in retirement. Now their studies show that for a single you need 545,000 at retirement and for a couple you need $640,000. Um, so we saw the variety of results from our audience there. Well this is what the official studies say. But I think everyone's just got to ask themselves, you know, could you live comfortably with peace of mind on that amount? And the answer will be different for everyone. And that is because retirement looks different for everyone. 
okay? So for some people, they will want to continue in the workforce, continue working part-time. Others want to just get out completely and never see a day of work in their, in their life again. Some people want to stay in their family home as long as they can. Others have plans to downsize. You know, some people like to drive a Mercedes, some a Toyota. Some families like to have two cars. Some like to have one car. And, and most retirees want to want to travel, but some for some, their idea of traveling is, uh, you know, five-star hotels, flying first class around the world. And for others, it's hitching up the caravan and going down the coast. And then, of course, children and grandchildren. Uh, there's a variety of ways that people want to help their kids and grandkids, both from an emotional point of view and from a financial point of view. So all of those factors will determine the answer to the question of how much you need to retire. And you've really got to go through a detailed process uh, with an expert to work that out. Now, regardless of what your amount ends up being, I can tell you from our experience in dealing with thousands of people heading into retirement and through retirement that there are two types of clients we see, and I want to talk you through these. The first one is represented here in the blue uh, on the graph. And so you start with an amount of money, okay, and you invest that money to get a return and provide for your lifestyle. Now, that, that money will go up and down in line with the markets over time, but it will produce an amount of income every year. And for these first type of people, that amount of income is enough for them to do all the things that they want to do, okay? So in other words, they don't have to touch their capital. They're just living off the income. Now, the conversations when those people come into the office is very much around, you know, oh, tell us about your last trip. How are the kids doing? Uh, you know, they don't even talk, they don't even think about their finances. You can tell it's just not playing on their mind. They've got absolute peace of mind and they're just enjoying their life, which is fantastic. So, you know, if possible, working with a professional to try and get yourself into that position is always the primary aim. The second type of person, which is represented in the red here, either uh, doesn't have the, the same amount of money to start with, or they just need more money every year than the income that they're generating, okay? So what that means is they're eating into their capital a little bit every year. Now, that's actually okay. That's how the system is designed. You're meant to work all of your life, build up your superannuation, and then retire and draw down on it over your remaining years. But the reality is, when these people come into the office, the conversation is much more like, okay, um, we'd really love to take a trip over the next couple of years. You know, do you think that we could afford it? You know, our kids are going through a bit of trouble. We'd love to help them. You know, how do you think we could make that work? Um, what are our investments doing? How much income are we earning? You can just tell with these people that finances are playing a lot more on their mind. They don't have that peace of mind. And they're just, they're just not living their life to the full because of the stresses of their finances. So whatever situation you find yourself in, I think working with a professional to try and get that peace of mind to allow you to live comfortably and do, do the things that you want, that's the absolute key. And it is possible under either scenario one or scenario two. So really your retirement strategy, yes, there's a checklist of things that you need to tick off. And we're gonna look at some of those things today. Superannuation, accessing government benefits, how do you protect yourself against the market ups and downs? But really it comes down to two things that your retirement plan needs to achieve for you. One is giving you peace of mind and two is allowing you to live the lifestyle that you desire. And if you achieve those both, both of those things, well, you're in a great place for retirement. So let's talk about some of these, uh, these things that you need to do to achieve that. The first thing is understanding your investments. Now, you don't need to be an investment professional, but you do need to have a core understanding of your investments during your retirement years. We've seen a big market downturn this year with COVID-19, and it's not all that long ago that we saw the global financial crisis. So it's relatively fresh in people's minds what can happen with markets over time. But the reality is these downturns are going to happen very regularly, uh, multiple times throughout your retirement years. So you've just got to be set up to be prepared for them to protect your money. And I love this chart here because what, what this shows is the annual return from the share market. So if you were invested from the 1st of January to the 31st of December, what was your return during that year? 
and that's represented in the blue bar. So if we take 2012 and 2013 there, uh, you can see they're similar years. The return from start to finish for the year was 15% in both years. So a very, very strong, strong year. But during the year, and these are represented by the red dots, there was a downturn in both of those years. The market in 2012 fell by 10%. In 2013, it fell by 11%. So every year at some stage, the market falls, okay? But then it does recover. And in most of those, ye th those years there, it finishes the year with a, with a strong positive return. So we've got to get used to that volatility and we've got to be set up and prepared for those market downturns because they are going to happen. It's just a reality. So how do we do that? Well, this really comes down to that, that question of understanding your investments. Do you know what you own? And I'll take you through a couple of examples here. So the way that many Australians have their superannuation set up is, is symbolised by the pie chart in the middle, which would be your typical balance fund or growth fund, okay, where it's got a little bit of Australian shares, a little bit of international shares, some property, fixed interest, cash, etc. But it's all tied up into one fund and you just own units in that fund. You can't actually see the individual investments that you own. Contrast that with the approach that's around the outside here, where you've got all of these brand names, companies you know and you recognise, okay? And you'd have your own cash, your own term deposits as well within the superannuation account. Now, you can do this in most superannuation funds in Australia, okay? You don't need anything, anything particularly special. So I just wanna ask everyone, I wanna put up another, another poll. Um, I want to ask everyone the question, do you understand where your superannuation is invested? If we just spend 30 seconds just getting some answers on this, I understand the investments completely. I've got a vague idea of the investments uh, or I leave it to the superannuation fund and I don't pay much attention. Let's just get a sense from the room of, of where we sit here and then I'm going to take you through an example. Okay, just I'll end that poll now. Uh, and share those results with you. You can see we've got pretty much an even split across the board, some who understand it uh, and some who, some who don't, some who leave it to the superannuation fund. And that's good, we typically find that. So um, just speaking through an example, if we go back to the, the global financial crisis, what, un what understanding your investments does is it gives you peace of mind. And that's one of those key things that we've talked about that you need. And I'll use the example here of Commonwealth Bank. So in the global financial crisis, most of our clients owned Commonwealth Bank in their superannuation portfolio. Now its share price went from $64 down to $26. It was more than a 50% drop. But people knew it was Commonwealth Bank. You know, they knew it was going to be here in five years' time. They knew it would be here in 10 years' time. It was still paying a dividend. It didn't bother them, okay? Of course, I mean, it's never nice to see that your money's worth less on, on paper than what it was yesterday. But they had peace of mind. They continued doing all the things that they wanted to do. And eventually, Commonwealth Bank's share price uh, recovered and, and went far higher than where it was before that. Contrast that to the people who had the, the, the balance fund, like in the middle, and they saw their balance drop by 30, 40, 50%. They had no idea what was going on, no idea what the investments were, did they need to be worried? You know, it played on their mind a lot. So peace of mind is key. And by understanding your investments, you get that. Now, the second reason why this is critical, and this, this is so important uh, in protecting yourself through retirement, is that having that, that alternative approach where you've got your own investments protects you through the market downturns, the market cycles. And we're gonna look at an example here. So in the middle, if you, if you take the balance fund as, as, as an example, when you retire, you are actually drawing down on your fund every month, taking an amount out for you to be able to spend and, and go on living your life. Now, what you're doing in that balance fund is you're selling a little piece of every piece of the pie every month to get your money out. Okay, so you're selling a little bit of the Australian shares, international shares, cash, et cetera. You don't get that option. Now, if the market was to have a severe downturn, um, which we know will happen at some stage over time, 
let's just say, for example, it was worth 50% less. Well, now you, you're actually selling double the amount that you were the previous month to get the same amount of dollars in your bank account for you to go and spend. And so by the time the market recovers, you've lost so much of your money because you've sold down on those units. All right? And it's a real problem. And, and during the GFC, a lot of people had to go back to work because they simply couldn't recover their money. However, using the approach around the outside where you've got your own investments, you've got your own cash account, your own term deposits, what happens is all the dividends and interest from the investments goes into cash. You then take your monthly amount just out of the cash account and therefore you just leave your shares there and give them the time to, cut, to recover in value and you can recover your, your money over time. Now, I'm going to bring this to life with an example from the global financial crisis. So this is an example where the share market dropped by half and then recovered over the next five years. And we've got Max and Jane here who both have a million dollars in their superannuation to start with. And they were drawing $6,000 a month out for their living expenses, which they spent in full. So that's $72,000 a year, which is quite a high level on a balance of a million dollars. Um, but let's have a look at the impact that it made. So Max, in this scenario, when the share market drops by half, as I explained, he now needs to sell double the amount of units to get his $6,000 a month. Okay, so what happens is he's selling so many units during that time until the market recovers that by the time it does, he's spent down so many of his units or his money that at the end of that period, at the end of that six years, he's only got $375,000 left in his fund, okay, which is a terrible outcome. Now, contrast that to Jane. What happens with Jane? Exactly the same investments, you know, a little bit of Australian shares, international shares, property, cash, fixed interest. So there's no difference in the investments, the level of risk, any of that. It's just in the way that it's set up to protect her. So she continues to get her dividends and interest into her cash account and she takes her $6,000 a month just out of the cash account, which leaves all of her investments there. Okay, so that they can recover over that five-year period. And, and by the time she gets to the end of that period, she's still got 838000 in her fund, which is significantly $463,000 better off than Max. So this, this is a real-life uh, example to show the difference that this can make. Uh, and it's the way that we set all of our clients up in retirement. It's just absolutely key. So I'm happy to uh, take any questions on that. Um, as I explained at the start, please use the chat box, the Q&A box. Um, if you've got any questions, we can answer those as we go. Um, alternatively, we will have time at the end to go through any uh, questions and answers. Superannuation, I wanna spend a few minutes talking about superannuation. Uh, it's really, it really is one of the last free lunches that's out there. Um, and so it's just critically important heading into retirement that you maximize your superannuation. Now, why is super so good? Well, for one, it reduces your personal income tax on your income, okay? When you're contributing, those contributions go in at a much lower tax rate than if you took them as wages. Uh, it has very tax effective earnings. And in fact, all the earnings during your retirement years are tax free. Um, it's forced retirement savings. It is an effective estate planning tool. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit in a minute. And uh, the best thing is it provides a tax free income in retirement as long as you're over age 60. Okay, so like I say, it's really one of the last free lunches. Now let's talk about um, contributing to super. Okay, so. There's, there's a few ways that you can contribute to your super. Um, the two main ways are broken down between what's called concessional contributions and non-concessional contributions. Uh, or put simply, that means before tax and after tax, okay? Now, before tax contributions are those that go in from your employer uh, or through your salary sacrifice, and there's a limit of $25,000 a year in total that can go in. Non-concessional are just those that you put in from your bank account, okay? Um, put in yourself after tax, and there's a limit of $100,000 a year, or you can do three years in one. So you could do 300,000, and that means you can't then contribute for the next 
two years until that period resets. So that's concessional and non-concessional contributions, both very effective ways to build your superannuation. Now, there's a new rule that's come in that, that uh, is not well known, uh, and it's just fantastic uh, to help people reduce their tax as they approach retirement and save for their retirement. We're using this for a lot of people who've been made redundant um, and are getting a whole lump sum of income in one year, or it can be very effective for people, for example, who sell an investment and may have a capital gain that they need to reduce as they come into retirement. It's called the catch-up concessional contribution rule. It's a bit of a mouthful. But what happens is if your balance is less than 500000 you can effectively bring forward the limits from the prior year to make an extra contribution in this year. So let's just work through a quick example of this. In year one, you've got a, a contribution limit of 25,000, okay? That's the standard limit every year. So let's just say, for example, that in that year, year one, you contributed 15,000 in the blue there. So 10,000 came in from your employer and you put in another $5,000 yourself through salary sacrifice. So that left 10,000 that was unused in year one. Go ahead to year two, well, you've now got the standard $25,000 limit that you'd have that year, but you can also bring forward that unused $10,000 from the prior year. So in year two, you could make $35,000 contribution if you wanted to, okay, and claim that as a tax deduction. Let's just assume in year two, you didn't make any superannuation contributions. Therefore, in year three, you've got your normal limit of $25,000 Plus you can bring forward those prior years of unused limit, which is 35,000. So you've now got a total of $60,000 that you could put in before tax or, or claim a tax deduction for. So as I said, if you've got a large income in that year for some reason, like selling an asset or being made redundant or just through your, your employment, what a fantastic way to be able to save for retirement and reduce your tax at the same time. So that's one that's um, not often known. Now, there's a, a couple of others that are little known and uh, just provide a free kick for you as well. One is the government co-contribution. So if your income in a year was less than $51,000, the government will match an after-tax contribution that you make to your superannuation dollars uh, and they'll, they'll give you up to $500. So if you make up to $1,000, they'll give you up to a up to $500, 50% of that. So it's just, a, it's basically a free $500 uh, and we use that one a lot. The other one is the spouse tax offset. Now this one is little known by the community, but if your spouse earns less than $40,000 for the year, you can make a contribution to their superannuation up to $3,000 and you can get a tax offset. Uh, of up to $540 for yourself. So between those two measures, you know, there's basically a $3,000 that you can get yourself. So they're very effective. The other one I wanted to touch on was the downsizer contribution rules, um, which have been around for the last couple of years. So this is where if you sell, sell your family home and you're over age 65, which has actually now been moved to over age 67, They've moved the limit where you can contribute to super uh, without having to meet a work test, and that's up to 67 now. So if you're, if you're over that age, normally you couldn't put money into superannuation, but the downsizer contribution rules allow you to put up to $300,000 per person, so per individual, into your superannuation. Okay, it goes in as a tax-free contribution. So this is... This is a, a fantastic new rule and people that are already thinking about downsizing, well, they've now, between a couple, they've got an opportunity to put $600,000 of those proceeds into a tax-free environment. So we're using that a lot as well. So there's some of the uh, little known rules around superannuation that I think are useful. Something else which is often not concentrated on by the public is uh, the superannuation as an estate planning tool. Now, superannuation doesn't automatically form part of your estate, okay? So after this webinar, I want everyone on the call to go away and check their superannuation and make sure they've got a 
a death benefit nomination in place. You need to tell the superannuation fund where to pay your money if you pass away. Otherwise, they have the discretion to pay it where they think is the best place and, and you don't want to be leaving it up to them, okay? So it's a simple form to sign. It tells them where you want the money to go. Everyone needs to do that. Now, one of the other little known things about superannuation, you know, in Australia, we don't have death taxes or most people don't think we have death taxes. Actually, we do have a death tax by stealth uh, and that is the tax on superannuation. So when you pass away, if your superannuation is inherited by non-dependents like adult children, so this is often the case, your superannuation can attract tax of up to 17%. Okay, so it can be quite a, quite a lot. I mean, on a million dollars, that's up to $170,000 in tax. So it's nothing to be sneezed about. Now, there is something you can do about reducing this tax. Uh, and we do this with our clients heading into retirement. And it's called a recontribution strategy. Now, it sounds crazy, but what you do is you effectively pull your superannuation out, put it in your bank account, and the next day you put it back into superannuation. And by doing that, it goes in as tax-free money, and therefore it avoids uh, this lump sum tax on death. Now, you've still got to stick to the normal contribution rules, so we've got to be a little bit careful around that, um, but it's very effective in, in reducing that tax to your estate. Okay, so that's, uh, that's some other little known things about uh, superannuation. And again, I'm happy to take any questions um, from the audience around superannuation. Now, one of the overlooked factors that both Wayne and I have already, already touched on is this real transition into retirement from an emotional and lifestyle point of view. Uh, and we've both seen it with our clients um, time and time again, that people are just not prepared for this transition to retirement. So we want to stand, spend a few minutes just going through this. Now, from App's point of view, now, you, you can't spend 365 days a year playing golf. You, you need to have a plan with what you're going to do with yourself in, in retirement. And, you know, we've seen this time and time again with our clients that have been unprepared. And being able to share the stories of what others are doing um, has really helped our clients get a plan around, around their retirement. You do lose a lot of things exiting the workforce and heading into retirement. And some of them are, are, are overlooked and not thought about, you know, there's the social connection, obviously, with your workmates, a sense of accomplishment, a sense of purpose and direction, and obviously the routine and structure, uh, amongst other things. So those things, uh, when, when they disappear, it can create a lot of uh, stress for people, and you really do need to be prepared for how you're going to replace those things. Now, this is really Wayne's area of expertise. And as he said, he's helped thousands of people through this journey. So I'd, I'd really like to bring Wayne into the conversation now and get him to introduce his, what he calls his wheel of life and talk us through some of the main issues that he says, um, he, that he sees that people are unprepared for um, and some of the things that perhaps they can do, do about that. And just as I introduce Wayne, I'd like to run our final poll for today. So I'll just bring that up, which is, which is, do you have, do you have a lifestyle plan for your retirement? How many people have actually thought about this and have a plan? So yes, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I've given it some thought, but I'm not really sure. I'm not sure I'm just going to see how it goes or I don't know and it worries me. Can we just get some responses from the room and then I'll hand over to Wayne and he can talk through his wheel of life. Okay, so I'll, I'll end the polling there. So, look, this, this, is, this is actually a very strong um, result. A lot of people do have do have a fair idea of what they've got, which is, which is great. So I'll share those results up on screen. Uh, you can see there most people have got at least some idea of what they're going to do, which, which is fantastic. But with that, I'll introduce Wayne and uh, very interested to get your thoughts, Wayne, on this subject. Thank you very much, Andrew. That's, uh, that's a very interesting response and uh, one that we would see as being fairly typical. Um, when you start asking questions two and three about beyond thinking about it, you, that, that falls away quite considerably. Um, if we 
when we're talking to people about life after work uh, or transitioning, where there's, there's a graphic that we have um, on the screen now, and I'd like to spend a couple of minutes sort of working through that because this is the, I guess, the model that we use and we're talking to individuals. Um, and as you said earlier on, uh, with, the re with the current research uh, that's come out uh, in, in more recent times, that can be distilled down to four key areas, uh, which as you said before was health, purpose, family and finances. We tend to work with, uh, with this model, uh, but it still can be distilled into those four pillars you talked about before. Uh, a real consideration here is the outer circle. If we're talking to an individual, we want to get a sense of, of how they see life after work. Uh, one of the things that people don't appreciate now is that we have got a longevity bonus and people are living longer and healthier for a longer period of time. You talk to actuaries now and actuaries are saying that the average lifespan of an Australian, of a 60 year old Australian woman is now getting close to 90. That's a long time past work. And, um, and it's a long time to, to, to fund that particular uh, lifestyle that you're referring to. So that uh, understanding what life's going to be um, is an important part of that equation. The other thing too is uh, the, on the outer circle is that um, how one wants to transition from work. We know from the thousands of people we've spoken to that the majority of people would like to phase out of work rather than uh, just, uh, just bluntly leave the workforce if they can. Um, and so when we're, work, we're working with organisations, we're looking at how we can develop some transition strategies. That's different from say the superannuation transition strategy you referred to, but we're looking at how people might be able to work differently and how they may be able to uh, work on a transitional plan. Uh, and just this morning, we were talking to a, a large employer uh, about this very thing. They're dead run internal focus groups and a lot of the mature age people within those focus groups are talking about ways and means that they might be able to scale down. And the other thing too, regardless of what decisions you are making, there's always going to be a financial consideration and a financial implication there. If a person is going to, or considering working differently, they need to speak to someone like Andrew uh, to understand what that means in terms of their short, medium and long-term goals, if they have goals. The, 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 the inner circle really represents you or me. And um, uh, what we tend to find here is that um, no one would, uh, would respond to this in the same way. Uh, and when we look at the, at the, at the eight areas here, we've got the area of work or career. I like to work, use the word work in some cases or vocation. There's the, there's the area of family. Uh, and then work can be different ways of working. Uh, we're seeing a lot of people in that, in, in that mature age cohort are now looking at uh, what they call pro, uh, portfolio careers, trying a number of different options when they first leave the workforce, even before they leave the workforce. We're starting to see a trend towards uh, uh, mature age workers uh, going into their own business um, or doing pro bono work. Uh, and there's, there's a range of options there that uh, we can drill down on. When that starts to blend with the family, it's, it's around the nature of the family, whether it is a blended family, uh, it is about grandparenting, it could be about elder care, and uh, it could be about uh, housing and, and, and where you're going to ultimately spend your retirement days. Uh, we see, we know from the research again, that the majority of people would prefer to stay within their own area code or region but there are other elements there too that people consider we're seeing people might want to leave and even go into state to be closer to family. Uh, so there's a range of factors there and a, and a range of questions we'll drill down with an individual to understand what even the connection between those two. But then you start to go beyond that and start to uh, inquire about how they're going to spend their time and energy uh, and what's going to get them out of bed in the morning. Um, this is a very important area, which is the social recreational side. We know from research again that uh, one of the issues that people have when they leave that the relationships uh, and the work environment is one of loneliness and social isolation. So how can you build uh, community activity 
and community connection into their plans and again prior to leaving the workforce and that can take the form of sporting clubs it might take the form of volunteering it might take the form of um, of engaged in social clubs like Aprobus, etc. Uh, but the important thing is that people think about it and understand what resources are in their community. Um, the I'm doing some work in the library sector at the moment, and I'm just highly impressed with the way in which libraries have responded to COVID-19. And they've become a really important focal point for people to both connect and also to utilise the resources of a library. They've done some wonderful work in, in outreaching the community. Um, the whole idea of volunteering too is, uh, is becoming increasingly important. Um, and in a lot of cases, we'll find people will say, look, I'd love to be able to give back and volunteer. I don't know where to go. And so we're now spending a lot of time helping people uh, understand what is what the possibilities are. And in some cases, even creating volunteer or community engagement activities for them. That's often done in association with the work with their, with their employer, uh, where we're trying to create this, this community engagement with both employees and also uh, retirees. The area of finances you've covered uh, very, very effectively, but that's something that we know uh, that whatever occurs with inside that sector, inside that wheel, which personalizes things for everyone, there'll be a financial implication. So having access to a trusted advisor and a trusted professional, not just in finances, but it may well be on the legal side for estate planning, etc. But having access to that trusted help is so important. Uh, we also challenge people about what's going to keep them curious and the area of learning becomes a, an important part of things here. There, there are organisations, for example, like the University of Third Age, which are burgeoning pre-COVID and they will, they will continue to burgeon post-COVID where people want to maintain that curiosity and, uh, and, and either learn new hobbies, go back to school. We're seeing people going back to university. Uh, and we're seeing people uh, coaching and mentoring as well, which is another wonderful way in which you can utilize your capabilities and skills. These are all driven by, our, I guess, our values and beliefs and sense of purpose and those, those moral standards and principles that drive each and every one of us and create our priorities in life. And it's also underpinned by physical and mental health. Uh, you talked about the four pillars, Andrew, right at the start, and that it's so important that a person uh, is in good shape or their partner, uh, it, it, the, the individual, their partner's health can also have an impact on, on how, they get, how they're going to spend their, their non-work years. And we know that there is a period when people are vibrant and healthy. And I go back to your point earlier on from the webinar here today, Andrew, we encourage people to do things while you can, because you'll know that there is a time when you're not going to be able to uh, physically uh, be able to do some of the things you can do in your younger retirement years and to take advantage of that is a very important factor. Well, that's right. you... Just on that, just on that Wayne, I know you and I have often had a joke about that particular subject, which is, which might be worth mentioning. You've got to have a bit of a laugh and uh, Wayne has a certain name for the zones of retirement, you know, the early retirement, mid retirement, late retirement. Uh, and we do too at Apt Wealth, but we have a bit of a laugh with our clients about it. And, and we call the early stage the go-go zone. And that's where you're still fit and healthy. You can travel and go out and do the things that you want to do. And then the mid stage we call the go slow zone. You can still do a bit of travel, a little bit of going out, but you can't do the things that maybe you used to. And then the latter retirement years is the no-go zone. So <laughs> it's a bit, bit of a joke, but it does, does turn out to be true. You know, we find our clients spend more in their early years than they do in their, in their latter years of retirement. That's right. And there's, there's, that, there's a graph which is known as a retirement smile uh, where you'll see that uh, it, it is like a, a U-shape and, um, and that, that's, in turn, that's, that's in terms of expenditure because uh, as we get in the latter years, that's where health costs start to um, uh, increase. And, uh, but that's why we say to people to take advantage of things while you can and do that with a, with a trusted authority. When you have a look at that particular graphic, uh, you, you'll, you'll appreciate that no two people will fill that out the same way. And that's what personalizes the process. When you start to coach people and help them with their life stage plan, we like to use the word life stage plan, which will differ from when they were 45 
the 55 and 65 and, and beyond. Um, this is what personalizes it because you bring your priorities to the fore. But one of the things we like to remind people of that this, all of these areas have got some relevance and, uh, and it's really important that you're working on them as early as you can and you're doing it with trusted advice. Thanks, Andrew. Great, excellent. Thanks for that, Wayne. So, look, on the, on the trusted advice piece, it, it is really important and dealing with your finances, uh, it's, it's an area of really high trust. You have to have trust in the people that you're dealing with. Uh, and so, look, Apt Wealth Partners, you know, we've got a lot of experience in dealing with people on this retirement journey. Uh, this is this is Apt Wealth here. So we have offices up in Sydney, in Melbourne, down in, and down in Geelong. Uh, we have have over fifty staff and look after about three thousand families across the country. So we've got the size and ex experience to be able to deal with this. Now the important thing is that we're privately owned, so we don't have our own products and investments. It's not like going to a bank or an institution where you, you're being sold their their products. We're just trying to provide people with the advice to put them in the best situation and live their best life in retirement. You can see some of our awards there, some of our community partners as well. Now, the way the process works when you see an advisor at Apt Wealth, we have a first get, get to know you meeting, which is at our cost, okay? So it's really sitting down, you get in comfort with us that you can trust us, uh, you can build a relationship with us because like I say, it is a very high trust relationship. You know, we, we need to understand your fears, your dreams, all of those things. And the more that you open up, the more that we can tailor your plan to help you have that peace of mind to live the lifestyle that you want. And if you don't get that, that level of trust, well, then it's important that you find the right person where you do have that level of trust. So the first meeting's there um, for you to try and uh, get that level of trust in us and also for us to really get an understanding of you and your situation, as well as what you want to do in the future, what your dreams are, like I say, what your fears are, all of that. And then we take all of that away and we design a step-by-step -step roadmap for you, which are all the things that we think that you should do, how to structure yourself to make the most of your, of your money and your retirement years, okay? We then get back together with you, uh, explain that, answer any questions you've got, uh, make sure you're comfortable with it, and then we help you execute on that plan, put everything in place to set you up correctly. And then every year we get together with you, we review your situation, we make changes according to all the legislation changes, the market changes with the economy, and just your personal life changes as well to make sure that we stay on track so you're living your life, enjoying yourself today, and you've still got an eye on tomorrow and planning for tomorrow as well. So that's really how the how the process uh, works with Apt. So um, after this, after today, we will send out every, to everyone a copy of the recording of today's webinar. We've also, I think, most people on this on this webinar today have already downloaded our eight step guide to uh, how much you need to retire and planning your retirement, but we'll also have links to access that again, as well as some of our other useful tools uh, that, um, that can be used to help you plan your retirement. So with that, I, I mean, we've still got a few minutes left. So I really like to just open up to the floor. Either you can use the chat box um, to ask any questions that you've got of myself or of Wayne, uh, or, you know, if you're brave enough, feel free to come off mute and, uh, and ask a question as well. Wayne and I are happy, happy to answer any questions that are out there. Who's gonna be first? Wayne, just while we give people a second, one of the interesting things that um, we're finding at the moment with COVID-19, and, and you, you might, might reflect on this as well, is just people's changing values and attitudes at the moment. You know, they're really reflecting on what's important to them in life through COVID-19. I think it's shone a light on, on some of the things perhaps they were doing that, that actually weren't as important to them. Uh, as, as some of the real things, you know, the inability to see family at the moment, the inability to travel, you know, it's really highlighting to people what's important. And, you know, they, people, people have often said money 
money doesn't buy happiness. But I don't think that's entirely true. I think you know, spending money on the things that are important to you that make you happy definitely can buy happiness. You got any reflection on that? Yeah, we're finding the same thing that it really is putting a blowtorch on things for some people. They're starting to appreciate uh, the importance of that family component and, and, the, and the importance of uh, connection with friends. Uh, you're seeing, you know, that you're seeing a proliferation now of Zooms and uh, meetings uh, with family, etc. But it, I think it's it's really focused, uh, and that's probably reinforced also by that research you referred to referred to earlier. Is this, the, the increasing significance of um, connection with family and friends, and family in that research was an extended family as well. Uh, but the importance of, um, and, and I, I'm seeing this myself, uh, the stuff that we're doing in re-engaging with people or being, uh, or being contacted ourselves just to see how you're going. And um, I think it has really put a focus back on uh, some of the real values and some of the real priorities that we all need to be pretty clear about as we move, as we move up, move forward. Yes. Great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, we just got a, a, qu a question a question here about setting up your superannuation to prevent the next economic downturn like COVID or the global financial crisis. Um, so thanks very much for that question. I'll just go back to our slide here uh, that we talked through, which which is just one of the absolutely critical lessons, I think, for people to take out of, out of today. You can't prevent, we can't prevent another financial crisis from happening, it will happen. That's just the reality. But what we can do is set you up, set you up to protect you from those times when, when they do occur. And it really comes down to this, this difference um, of having your own cash component in your superannuation, directing all the income from the investments through to, through to that component, and then pulling, pulling your monthly allowance out of that cash component and leaving all of your investments there to weather the ups and downs of the market. And that's really the way to protect your money. We've been through with our clients through the global financial crisis, through the latest downturn and many others, and all have uh, survived and continued on with their lifestyle uh, without any change. So that's really how it ends that question. Um, John's got a question here. I'm retired 58, but with COVID-19, it's put our plans on hold and looking as though 2021 will not allow us to travel overseas. So looking to go back to work, is this allowable? Thanks for that question, John. Um, so yes, the, the answer to that question is there's nothing ever stopping you from going back and doing work. Correct. When, when you retire, and I use those that, that term in quotation marks, but retiring from a legal financial point of view, what it does, you sign a form with your superannuation to say I'm retired and I don't have the intention of working again. And that then gives you permanent access to, to your superannuation, okay? Unlimited access. However, if the next week you changed your mind or you got a job offer and you wanted to go back to work, that is absolutely fine. The only requirement from that superannuation point of view is that it's your intention at that time to stop working more than 10 hours a week, okay? And so long as you do that, you've then got access to your super, you can then go back to work, no problems, and you still maintain access to that superannuation. If it wasn't a superannuation issue and you hadn't made that declaration, well, of course, there's nothing stopping you going back to work anytime in your life. So absolutely, we're finding that a lot at the moment. People are saying, well, we can't do anything else. We may as well just keep working. And they're, they're continuing to work for another 12 months um, to see what the situation's like. So yeah, don't hesitate in doing that. Um, Wayne, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add. That oh, no, just that the one one of the trends um, has been that people are staying at work longer anyway, and so we're seeing a, quite a linear increase in people that are staying beyond what was the traditional retirement age, and I think that's only going to continue. Uh, the difference there is in a lot of cases they will for all the reasons we talked about before, they'll stay within that work environment, but then they'll try and negotiate uh, with their employer to work differently, even in some cases job share, uh, but certainly staying uh, attached to the work environment is something that we're seeing. And this is this is reinforced by ABS data too, which has seen, which has witnessed a, quite a, a linear increase in people staying at work way beyond the, 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 the traditional retirement age. Excellent. Thanks. Yeah. 
We've got another question here, and, and I encourage everyone, you know, this is your chance. You've got Wayne and I here. If you want to ask a question, we're more than happy to take it. So please, please type it into the chat or the Q&A box. Question here about transition to retirement pensions. If taken out after 60, is it tax-free for an individual? Uh, but is the transition to retirement taxed at 15% in the fund? That That's correct. So uh, if you take a pension payment out of your superannuation after 60, that is that is always tax-free, okay? The difference is that if it's a transition to retirement pension, which means that you're still working while you're taking that money out, it is the earnings in the fund are taxed at 15%, okay? Whereas if you're retired and you're taking the money out, the earnings are tax-free. That's the differentiator there. So hopefully that explains the... Uh, that question. But a transition to retirement strategy is fantastic. You know, it really does, touching on all the points that Wayne's made, it really allows you to start scaling back from work, start introducing those other aspects into your life and get the balance right. And it does make, make that transition much easier, not only financially, but, but from an emotional and lifestyle point of view as well. So, uh, okay. I can also add to that too, the, the, the conversation we had this morning with an employer was that there was a, a mature age individual that did have a health problem. Uh, he, was, he was very skilled and very experienced and hadn't thought that, uh, about working differently. Uh, within this work environment, they tend to work, there's a high percentage of people working full time. Um, he had this, he has this health issue He's got some tremendous expertise uh, and information he can mentor and coach. And we're now moving to the stage now where he's, uh, and, and the organisation is happy for him to scale down, utilise his skills and expertise, uh, and, um, and, un and he understands now what the financial implications are. He's also worked with a, a financial advisor to have the confidence to then go and talk to the organisation about scaling back or phasing down. Excellent. Thanks, Juan. Any final questions from the audience? Looks like that might be it, it Wayne. So listen, thanks everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate you, you giving up some of your time. Hopefully that's been of help to you. As I said, we will send out a follow-up a follow email after, after this with a recording of the session, but also some other tools and, and white papers to help you in planning your retirement. If you do need anything uh, to help you, please reach out. Myself and Wayne are very happy to, to be of assistance. So thanks again, everyone. Stay safe and uh, all the best.